Okay, um, we're going into Genesis chapter 12 tonight, um, but we're going to start up in, in Genesis chapter 11 in verse 26. And so, um, you know, I haven't been up here in a while, so I'm a little nervous. <laughs> so if I stutter or whatever, please um, just... Uh, what's that? <laughs> they give away their eggs. We gave all our eggs away already. They can't throw any eggs at you. Uh, but I saw some tomatoes down there. <laughs> yeah. And celery. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, as we begin here, as I really looked into um, Genesis chapter 12, um, the Lord really, really began to make this alive and really new uh, in my own heart and my own mind. And I really began to see <clears throat> how in Abraham, God began to really direct in a really focused way um, his promise to, um, to Satan that he was going to crush his head. And that, and that through the woman's seed, he was going to raise up Messiah our deliverer and rescuer and defeat Satan. And so as we read and as we read through Genesis and the count of creation and, and everybody wigging out and everybody really getting violent and the whole earth just, just, just full of violence and hatred and this darkness. And so the destruction that came and the salvation of Noah and his family and, and, but, but I, when we come to Abraham, all of a sudden, it's like we see all of a sudden this through, the, through, through Abraham and God really directing this family and raising up this family to raise up this nation, to raise up uh, the family of David and so on, and ultimately Messiah. And so... So here we go. We're going to start in, uh, Reb or in Genesis 11, 26. We're going to start with Terah because Terah was uh, uh, of the family of, uh, through Noah. So Terah lived 70 years and he begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And this is a, the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. <clears throat> now these are the descendants of Shem, um, who was one of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so Haran begot Lot, and Haran died before his father in Terah, in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans, Mesopotamia, which really was a a land that was from like uh, Arabia and the southern peninsula of, of Arabia and all the way up into Assyria and Syria and Lebanon. This was all the land of Ur. And so um, that's where, where Haran died. So Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah the daughter of Haran, who had died in, in Ur, the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. So, in verse 31, Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out of them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, it says in 12.1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So it's interesting because in Acts chapter 7... In, when um, uh, Stephan is sharing the history of Israel with the, the Pharisees, he says in Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 5, he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham 
when he was in Mesopotamia, or the land of Ur of the Chaldeans, before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and he settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are living. So it's God had said to Abram, get out of Ur, get out of your family, go to the land that I will show you. But then it says that his father took him and his family. So evidently, I think evidently here, it's Abram had shared with his father what God had told him. And so his father took him and his family and they went to Haran. And they stayed in Haran until Abram's father, Terah, died. And then, as God had said to Abram, go into the land that I will show you. So Abram leaves the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. It's interesting. People don't know exactly where they were living at that time. Because Ur is all the way down in the southern part of Arabia, but it's also up above in Assyria, Syria, and Lebanon. It could have been a very long trek, or it could have been a short trek. We don't really know. So anyhow, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country. Uh, it's interesting, the word means take a walk. God said to Abraham, take a walk. In Australia, they call it a walkabout. Let's take a walkabout. And that's really what he said. Uh, take a walk. And so Abram begins to walk. Go out from your country, from your family, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. To the land that I will show you. Remember, Abram didn't know where he was going. God just said, Abraham, walk about. So Abram goes. But the Lord says to a land that I will show you. And so in verse in chapter 13, after Lot leaves Abram, God comes to Abram and he said, Abram, look to the north. Look to the south. Look to the east. Look to the west. Look all around and walk about the land. I give it to you. So it wasn't just that God was saying, Abram, go to a land that I will show you. Abram goes, steps, steps feet into Canaan, and that's it. No, God wants to show him the whole thing. As I thought about it, I thought about you and I and our Christian walk and our Christian life. Because God doesn't want us just to get saved and come into the land of promise, as it were, just get saved. But he wants to say, now, look. Look to the right, look to the left, look to the north, look to the south, and walk through this whole land, this whole salvation, this whole rich salvation that God has given us in Jesus Christ. God wants us to experience every bit of it, you see? And that's what he's saying to Abram. Look, man, it's, I give it to you. It's all yours, you see? And so he takes Abram. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so this is God's covenant with Abram. He tells him, take a walk. I'm going to make a covenant with you. And there's a land covenant here, and there's a Messiah covenant here. Two covenants. Number one... I will make you a great nation. When did that happen? When did Abraham become a great nation? I asked myself that. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 5, when they were delivered out of Egypt, the Lord says, You shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean. And he went down to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. But there he became a great and mighty and populous nation. 
They went down 70 in number, right? But when they left, there was over 600,000. So this is literally fulfilled at that time. And of course, we know it's still being fulfilled. And we know that throughout um, the gospel, uh, um, uh, the millennial period, and then uh, finally in, you know, new heaven and new earth, we know that, that Israel is going to be and continue to be this great and mighty and populous nation. And so fulfilled at that time. Um, also, we have the second part of this where he says, I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abram, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. And so, God actually came to Abram and preached the gospel beforehand to Abram. Praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? But, but, and so we see Messiah. We see Messiah prophesied here through Abram's seed, through the nation of Israel. But not only that, but we see that ultimately God is saying that Israel itself is going to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. For in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3, Thus says the Lord, I will return, um, in, in yeah, chapter 8, verse 3, I will return to Zion, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. So the prophecy concerning the coming of Jesus Christ, coming to Jerusalem and setting up his throne in the city of Jerusalem. Now in Zechariah, again, in chapter 8, verse 13, he goes on. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. And it will come about that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you and that you may become a blessing. Do not be afraid and let your hands be strong. So the nation of Israel itself as Messiah comes and lives in its midst and the grace of God is poured out from Jerusalem upon all of the other nations, the nation of Israel itself also becomes a blessing. And so we see this fulfilled in Messiah, in the nation of Israel, as he establishes his throne in Jerusalem. And so God will fulfill his promise to Abraham. Notice here, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Isn't that wonderful? We think of the words of Jesus Christ as he, as he was resurrected. Before he was resurrected, giving the commission to his disciples and him saying, I will be with you till the end of the age. I will. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. These wonderful promises, these wonderful words of God. I will. It's his covenant. As I walk through the, uh, the uh, you know, the chapter 12 of, of Genesis here, I see God's covenant and God's faithfulness and God's grace. He calls Abram, Abram, walk with me as you will. Take a walk. Let's walk about. But it's all about God's grace and God's faithfulness to his covenant. You know, I think about Abraham. Abraham never received, never received an inch of property in this land that God showed him. He must, God must fulfill his promise to Abram. 
that he is going to have this land. This land is going to be Abram's. Abram must be resurrected. That's, you know, that's, you, <laughs> he's got to be. For God to fulfill his promise to Abram, he's got to resurrect, he's got to resurrect oh. Abram. Wow, man, that's awesome. Wonderful, wonderful promises to Abram. So, Abraham takes off. Abraham takes a walk. Verse 4 through 9. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. He was not supposed to go with Abram. But here it says Lot went with him. So Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed and, and to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Now remember Canaan. <clears throat> Canaan was a son of Ham, an, an offspring of Ham. Remember when Ham blew it with his father. And, and, and before Noah died, he prophesied over his sons. And over the son, his son Ham, he cursed Canaan. He said, cursed be Canaan. And that word, that word curse, it means to, um, it means to defile. It means to, um, I had it written down somewhere. Um, but he cursed Canaan and actually said that Canaan would be a very lowly people, a servant of servants. And so as, as, as Abram came into the land of Canaan, it was a, a, a people that were very, they were very dark. <clears throat> they were very corrupt. They were totally disorganized, chaotic. There were actually seven tribes in the land of Canaan. As we go on here, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, which is about uh, maybe a third of the way through the land of promise. And as far as the temp te uh, terebinth tree of Moriah, and the Canaanites were in the land. Now, the Canaanites were actually seven different tribes, the Perizzites, the Hezites, uh, Jebusites, the Hittites, and, <clears throat> and seven tribes. They were so bad that, remember, when Israel was going to come into the land, God had told them, destroy every, every person in the land of Canaan. Seven tribes, destroy them all. Don't keep a one. Only keep the animals. Everybody else you are to kill because they were so foul and so bad. And so Abram comes in to the land of Canaan. Now Abram had come from the land of Ur, which was a very idolatrous nation. Abram himself was an idolater. We know that his family were idolaters. We know that when um, Isaac sent his son, um, or when, uh, um, who was it, um, Abram sent Jacob sent his son Isaac up to Ur to get a, a wife, and he brought him down. They brought their idols with him. And so Abram was, he was an idolater, and his family idolaters, that was their culture. Um, but as we go on here, I also think that Noah had an influence in Abram's life. We'll see that as we go on. And so he comes into the land of Canaanites, the Canaanites, surrounded with child pornography, child sacrifice, um, adultery, um, polygamy, um, all kinds of darkness, I idol worship, um, just as dark as you, can, as you can imagine. But it says here that the Lord appeared to Abram. Abram, the Lord showed himself to Abram and said to him, to your descendants, I will give this land. Oh, well, thanks, God. 
<laughs> you know, as he, as he sees all of these people and everything, the Lord says, I'm going to give it to you, unbeknownst to Abram what, what that really was going to entail. But I will give you this land, another I will of God. So he has not given Abram this land yet. Abram's in heaven. He's got to come back. He's got to receive this land. And so, so he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So here we see Abram building an altar. The reason I think that Noah had an, uh, an effect and an influence in Abram's life is because this is the second, second place we see an altar built. The first place is in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. When, when Noah leaves the ark, the first thing that he does is he builds an altar and he sacrifices to the Lord. That's the only other place we see an altar being built is right here. I believe that Noah had an effect. A lot of uh, those, those men, uh, teachers that are into genealogies and, and mapping out years and everything say that Abra it's very, very possible that Abraham might even have talked with Noah. And I believe that's, to, that's true. And so I believe that in following Noah's example, Abram builds an altar here um, to the Lord who appeared to him. And I like this. It says here, uh, uh, second, uh, the Lord appeared to Abram in the first part of verse 7, last part of verse 7, to the Lord who showed himself to Abram. And it says that he moved there to the mountains east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar. So here's another altar, the second altar that Abram built to the Lord. And here it says that he called on the name of the Lord. The first altar, he just built an altar. It doesn't say that he called on the name of the Lord. Not until he built the second altar. And so he builds this altar <clears throat> between Bethel and Ai. Now Bethel, the name of Bethel is the house of God. Ai, the name Ai comes from the word ruin or destruction. So I thought, well, that's really interesting he builds an altar between the house of God and the house of ruin. And there he builds his altar. I thought, wow, that really spoke to me. Because it's, it's like Abram's a very young follower of Yahweh at this time. He's like everybody else. He's growing, he's maturing in his, in his surrender, in his life with Yahweh, his God. We see as we walk with Abraham through the book of Genesis and through his life with God that he grows and he matures step by step, just like you and I. So here he, he's like a young Christian that, that you know... Um, I don't know, man. I, I, yeah, I love the Lord, but yeah, I haven't really surrendered to him. And, and I'm going through trials and we'll see that, you know, Abraham fails here and everything. But he's just not quite sure like some of us. And so we build our altar, as it were, between a full surrender to God. And like I look back at my life when I first accepted the Lord. You know, some of it was really good, but man, I did a lot of things that were, you know, where it really came, co came close to uh, destroying my life. You know, marrying a woman that didn't know the Lord and getting involved in marijuana again and drugs and alcohol. And man, I found myself up in the mountains, um, you know, and, and just totally blown away, just totally back, in, back into the world.
and God calling me back, back to the altar, if you will. Um, and so Abram's the same way. He builds his altar right there between, you see. Let us build our altar in Bethel. <laughs> That's where we belong, you know. And so, so he built an altar, and he called upon the name of the Lord, Yahweh. He calls upon Yahweh. And so, but now, Abram journeyed going on still south. In the King James here, it's south, but it's literally the Negev, the south desert area. And he keeps going. And so, now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will, ha it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please, say that you are my sister. She was his half-sister, by the way. Say that you are my sister, then it may be well with me for your sake that I may live because of you. Let me read the last verse and what it actually says. Please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me on account of you, and that I may live because of you. And so we find Abraham, number one, he made the mistake when he took Lot with him. Remember that Lot... Lot became the father of Moab and Ammon. And we know that Moab and Ammon were always hostile to Israel, always making war and trying to destroy Israel. And to this very day, doing the same thing. And in Psalm 83, in the last days when nations come against Jerusalem, we see that Moab and Ammon are one of those nations. So we see how a little transgression, how a little disobedience can become very terrible and affect history and affect a lot of people, you see. So that one thing that Abe did, and he didn't know it, you see. He's a young man, young Christian, or young follower of Jesus. But here, he blows it again. The reason, because... Maybe fear or hunger or, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's in Abram's mind, but there's a famine. He's going, what are we going to eat? What are we going to do? You know, and so he heads to Egypt. One thing we have to commend him is he didn't go back up to Ur. He didn't go back to the land of idolatry. He didn't go back to where he was before. But he does go down to Egypt. And he was not supposed to go there. God said, go to the land that I will show you. You see. But, so, it's interesting because we see Abram going down, down, down. First, we see him in verse 10 um, going south. In verse 11, we see him close to entering Egypt. He comes near to Egypt. And as he does, he looks at his wife and we find Abram in the survival mode, trying to save himself as he comes close to entering Egypt. Now, <clears throat> um, therefore, in verse 12, therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see me, they will say, this is his wife, they will kill me, and, when, and they will let you live. In verse 14, so it was when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was beautiful. And so we see the downward spiral of, may we say, disobedience? Remember Jonah. 
I see, and the same thing. Remember, Jonah disobeyed the Lord. He was supposed to go one way. Jonah went the other way. But then we're said that he went down to um, Joppa. Then he went down to the ship. Then he went down to the bottom of the ship. Then he went down in the bellies of the whale. And the whale went down. And we always see a, a downward um, spiral when we do what the Lord has not called us to do. And we see that in Abram's life there. <clears throat> so he comes into Egypt. And of course, it happens. Notice here in verses 9 through 20, there's no mention of the Lord. No mention of God. No mention of the Lord. Only one place where God comes to Pharaoh when Pharaoh takes Abram's wife. And he, he um, in verse 17, he says, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh. Only place in these verses that we see God mentioned. And, um, and what we do see, what we do see is that we see Abram turn his attention from God's call because of a famine, because of hardship, because of what he thinks is going to happen. He turns his attention from the Lord and he turns his attention to, may we say, survival mode. Um, and so, um, so, so hardship, it's hard. Anyhow, as we, as we keep going here, so it was when Abram came to Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman. She was beautiful. In verse 15, the princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Well, Pharaoh treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep and oxen and male donkeys and male female servants, female donkeys and camels. So he gets into uh, Egypt. Pharaoh takes Abram's wife from him and he begins to give all these wonderful things to Abram. You know, and I thought, I thought, you know, that's just like the world. When a Christian backslides or take, for instance, a pastor who leaves the word of God and begins to bring in part of the world to the flock. The world's going to make that man rich. The world and Satan is going to come to that person. We can see it today. And a lot of these pastors today that are getting away from the centrality of the gospel and the, and, and, and the focus on Jesus Christ and preaching the pure gospel of God and teaching the pure word of God, the world's going to bless them. I, I just was on line with a young pastor um, yesterday that um, he had no business to me being on The View in the first place. But he was on The View and they asked him about ab abortion and he totally, totally um, gave a, a lukewarm testimony, uh, uh, you know, of, of God's will and God's desire you know, and the world, I mean, the guy's rich and everything. And I, you know, but, but what I'm saying is, is that the world, when a man leaves the word of God and a man leaves the really ministering to the flock of God, the world is going to want to make that guy, you know, oh, hey, yeah. You see, I want to stay pure. I want to stay pure in the word of God. I want my focus to be directly. I never want to, I never want to wander off like Abram did here, you know. Um, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. God protecting his covenant. God protecting the bloodline. God looking at the promise of Messiah. And so 
he plagued Pharaoh here. It's interesting because we see um, in Exodus, we're going to see once again where God plagues Egypt to deliver Israel out of Egypt. But, 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 but in the end, we see the mercy and the grace of God. In, in um, I just want to, in Isaiah chapter 19, um, verses 19 and 20, In that day, speaking of the last days, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. And it will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. And they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors and he will send them a savior and a mighty one and he will deliver them. Then the Lord will be known in Egypt and the, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and will make sacrifice and offering, yes, and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. And so we see in the last days, yep, he plagues them here, but, but in judgment we see mercy because in the last day, God's going to pour out his spirit and they're going to come to the Lord and they're going to know the Lord in the land. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be known and he's going to know them. And they are going to be blessed. So in judgment, we see mercy. You know, even in Moab, in Ammon, in destroying, wanting to destroy. Where does Ruth come from? Ruth comes from Moab. And she's in the lineage of Messiah. The Canaanites. We see Rahab. In the lineage of Jesus Christ, we see in judgment, we see mercy, we see the grace of God, and we see the gospel. You see, even in all this stuff, we see the grace, the mercy, and God fulfilling his call and just trekking forward to fulfill his covenant and uh, uh, praise God, you see. And so all in this, we see God over all of this fulfilling his covenant. So Pharaoh called Abram in, in verse 18 and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say to me she's your sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here's your wife. Take her and go. Go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. And so... Pharaoh sends Abram away. This young man who knows the Lord. But Abram fails. As we look at this test, what kind of testimony does Abram have before Pharaoh? I thought about it. As he went down there, he offers his wife. You know, think about that. He offers his wife to save himself. I thought about Jesus and his bride. What if Jesus gave his bride to the world to save himself? Is that our Savior? No. Husbands, love your wives as Christ gave himself. As husbands, your wives, wives um, yeah, as Christ loved his wife and gave himself for her. <laughs> that he might build her up and wash her and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. No, uh, our husband gave himself for his wife. Abram says, hey, give, you know, so that you can save me. I wonder if God wasn't looking down at Abram saying, son, oy vey, son, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know, but, but poor Abram. And so, so, yeah, he, you know, Abram went away rich with goods and everything and thank God for God that he still had a virgin wife. Um, and, and, and so I thought, I thought, I wonder what Pharaoh thought about Abram. You know, I th Proverbs 20, uh, you know, number one, Proverbs 24.10 says, if you're slack in the day of diversity, your strength is small. 
Well, we look at Abram. Yeah, he was following Yahweh's, you know, uh, direction here and everything. But his strength is small. He failed in the day of adversity. Well, we can't condemn him because we all do it. But Abram's just like us. He was called out of Ur, a worshiper of idols. You know, coming to know the Lord, following the Lord's voice. But he failed. He failed miserably before Pharaoh, this king, and everything. You see, um, you know, in, um, I think it's in uh, Proverbs 25, 26, it says that a righteous man, when he fails before a, an unrighteous man, he's like, he's like a smelling cesspool. Proverbs 25, 26. So this was really a bad deal for Abram, for Pharaoh, a bad testimony for the Lord. You see, but God's overall presence would be made known. And in this chapter, we see two predominant things here that stand out. Number one, Abram's failure. And number two, God's power. God's grace, God's mercy, God keeping his covenant. We see the power of God in the failure of a man called of God. To me, when I look at this, I go, God, thank you so much. What an awesome testimony of God in his grace and in his mercy and God's power because nothing, nothing is going to is going to trash God's covenant. Nothing will cause God's covenant to crash. You see, the power of God. When I look at this, as I sit before the Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and what these scriptures say, I come to the conclusion. Number one, look at Abraham. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. God will complete that good, which, that good work which he began in you until the day of Jesus Christ. God just began a work in Abram. Just began. And as we continue through Abram's life, we see God is going to complete that good work which he began in Abram. So I, will, I go, God, thank you so much because I'm just like Abram and I see your work. I see that fulfilled in Abram's life where he takes a man and he just begins the work and he doesn't condemn him and he doesn't leave him because Abram fails. No, he continues to work and to take him and they continue to walk about, you see, deeper and deeper and deeper together, you see. And I see, like in Romans, where Paul writes in Romans eleven thirty three, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, his decisions, how untraceable are his ways. You see, I look at this and I go, God, I'm just hopping on, man. I'm just going to, I'm just going to take this journey with you. I'm, you know what? I am nothing. <laughs> I'm like Abraham. I'm just hopping on. Onto your covenant trek. Your covenant journey. Because it's all about you. And your power. And your keeping power. You see? What a wonderful testimony. But we can't just stop. You see? In Genesis chapter 12. If we just stopped in Genesis chapter 12, well, I, no, no, I can't stop there, Lord. This is too rich. I've got to go on. Just like Abraham, I've got to go on. You know, um, Mike and I, Mike Ruffner and I were talking the other day about Genesis chapter 12 and how um, the altar, how Abram built an altar. And I think that I, if I remember what Mike said, um, 
uh, one of the commentators that said, a man who builds an altar cannot falter. Is that what you said? No, I said men who build altars become altered men. Men who build altars become altered men. You know, and I thought about that, and, and somehow I came to men who build altars can't falter. But that's not true, because we see Abram faltering. But what a man of God does is he always goes back to the altar. You see, Abram goes back to the altar. We'll see in, in, in chapter, chapter 13. But we'll also see, like, you know, men who build altars become men who are altered. And how that true that is. But let me say this. It all depends on where you build your altar. You see? In Hebrews chapter 13, it says there, we have an altar that, that those priests who served the tabernacle have no, no right to come to. We have an altar. And as Jesus, he is our altar. You see, we come back to Jesus. We always come back to that one altar. That altar. You know, I thought about the, the tabernacle and the, um, the Ark of the Covenant and the glory of God coming on the, over the Ark of the Covenant. That Ark was covered in blood. That's our altar. The altar that's covered in the blood. And the glory of God, and if you really see the glory of God, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the glory of God. Descending upon that blood-covered altar. That's our altar. You see? I find it really interesting when you shared with us how curious it seemed to you that he had built that altar between Bethel and Ai. And now you're saying he came back to that altar and that you're saying it's a picture of how the altar we must come back to is Jesus. Right. Now, what stands between condemnation and heaven? There's that bridge, which is Christ. Right. So between Bethel and Ai, that altar is Christ. Is Christ. That's the connection. Amen. For, Good point. Yeah. So I just. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Nice. He is the bridge. He is the altar between the house of God and destruction, the cross of Jesus Christ. Good point. Praise the Lord. And so. Um, the encouragement to us tonight, you know, is, is that, you know, um, um, is that he who began a good work in you is going to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And as he promised Abraham that he would give him that land, Abraham had to be resurrected and Abraham has to to return. You and I are guaranteed the resurrection because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight as we come to the come to the table as we come to the altar as you will. We come to an altar that is covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we come to the cross our altar tonight to share in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Travis, as Travis comes up again, we're, yeah. Um, tonight, um, it's a wonderful lesson. Um, but I want to I stop here for a second because I want, to, I want to give you guys that study. I want you, I find something very interesting. It wasn't in the study tonight. But it was in last week's study 
where at the Tower of Babel, God said, let us go down and confound their language. I thought about that. For you who study, very interesting. There's only one other place in the Bible where it says that where God said, let us make man in our image. That's the only other place that I could find where that's said. What an interesting study that would make. So I'm interested. Anybody, you know, wants to study that out and and, because that just blows my mind. So, but as we come to the communion table tonight, remember, that Jesus Christ made a covenant with you and I. That covenant cannot be broken. It cannot crash. That covenant must be fulfilled. Where Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. By his body, by his stripes, We were healed, for we were like sheep going astray, but we have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood. The new covenant, the messianic covenant, shed for you, where we are saved by grace through the blood of Jesus Christ and receive that that new covenant, the power of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling Holy Spirit because of the covenant of Jesus Christ. And we do show his death until he comes where he will receive us to himself and we will rise and we will meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. And therefore, we look in anticipation, expectation, as we take that bread in our hands and we take that cup and we take and we we inhale that bread as it were and we take it into our mouth and we take it into our stomach and then we swallow that wine and, and it goes in and it's that covenant remembering once again the wonderful covenant of our Lord and Savior, risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father.